In the 1990s, Dave Cirilli, who was a friend of sports columnist Bill Simmons, came up with an idea, which he called the Ewing Theory. Now, what is the Ewing Theory? According to Dave, he was watching the New York Knicks back in the 90s when Patrick Ewing was a superstar. However, he realized that every time Ewing missed a game due to injury or he was in foul trouble and didn't play much, the Knicks would play much better without him. Dave and Bill discussed the details of this Ewing theory and came up with an actual definition of the term. In order for any situation to qualify for Ewing status, these two factors must be met. 1. A star athlete receives an inordinate amount of media attention and fan interest, and yet his teams never win anything substantial with him. And 2. That same athlete leaves his team, and both the media and fans immediately write off the team for the following season. But subsequently, the team ends up playing better than expected. Originally, Dave and Bill applied the Ewing theory across all major sports leagues, but in this video, we're only going to focus on the NBA. What's good, fellas? My name is Andy, and today we're going to take a look at a couple of instances of the Ewing theory in NBA history. And I'm going to try to explain why certain teams end up playing better after losing a star player. Alright, so obviously, we got to start off with Patrick Ewing himself. There were a lot of times when the Knicks played better without him, but the biggest example was their 1999 playoff run. Now, I know at this point in Ewing's career, he was already declining, but he was still the team's leading scorer. When he tore his Achilles in Game 2 of the Eastern Conference Finals against the Indiana Pacers, everyone thought the Knicks were done. They were the 8th seed and had a great playoff run, but with Ewing out for the rest of the series, the Knicks would have nobody to handle the Pacers' bigs like Rick Smiths, Antonio Davis, and Dale Davis. Except, they did. After Ewing went down, the Knicks won 3 of the next 4 games and won the series 4-2 and advanced to the NBA Finals. The main reason they played so much better without Ewing was because they played a smaller, faster, run-and-gun style of play that ran the Pacers off the floor. With Ewing on the court, the Knicks offense becomes much slower and grinded out, and that favors the Pacers. In games 1 and 2 with Ewing, the average pace of the games were 84, which means each team had 84 possessions per 48 minutes. But from games 3 to 6 when Ewing was out, the average pace was 89. With Ewing gone, the Knicks offense focused mainly on perimeter guys like Latrell Sprewell and Allen Houston who played at a much faster pace. And they took advantage of the Pacers' older and slower backcourt. It was clear that the Pacers were uncomfortable playing at this pace, as their old roster was not able to keep up. The Knicks reached the finals and then got killed by the Spurs. Okay, now let's take a look at a few instances of the Ewing theory happening before the term was even created. This is Elgin Baylor, a Lakers legend who had an amazing career, but he's probably remembered for his ridiculously bad finals record. He was 0 for 8 in the finals for his career, and it wasn't his fault that his teams kept losing to the Celtics. Or was it his fault? In the 1971-72 season, Baylor retired 9 games into the season because of knee problems. Right after he retired, the Lakers went on an NBA record 33-game winning streak, winning 69 total games and the NBA championship. How did losing a player who averaged 27 points per game for his career instantly make the Lakers better? Part of it was because Baylor wasn't very efficient at scoring and the Lakers had better options who were underutilized when Baylor was the focus on the offense. Guys like Jerry West and Gail Goodrich were better passers and ran the offense better than Baylor. But they didn't have the opportunity when Baylor was dropping like 30 or 40 points per game in the 1960s. The Lakers also picked up Will Chamberlain a few seasons prior. And even though he was older, he was still pretty good. Baylor was not a bad player by any means. And the Lakers going on a tear right after his retirement could just be a coincidence, since he didn't have a big role in his last season anyway. But with him gone, the Lakers changed up their style of play a bit and it led to more success. Another example was the 1988 Detroit Pistons. They lost in the finals to the Lakers in a pretty controversial series, which I talked about in another video. Then in the 1989 season, they traded away their leading scorer Adrian Dantley. And then they made the finals again, and this time, they swept the Lakers. Dantley was one of the most efficient scorers in history, but he also did not play any defense, like, at all. His game was kinda similar to Carmelo Anthony's, but even Melo was a better defender, which says a lot. Dantley was also a huge ball stopper and did not get along well with his teammates, which also contributed to the Pistons improving after his departure. He just did not fit in with the team's identity. He was known to be a very selfish player during his playing career and one of the biggest ball hogs in history. 
Dan Lee also seemed to have some beef with Isaiah Thomas during his time on the Pistons. In a 2014 interview, he made it very clear that he and Isaiah had a rivalry that caused a rift in the team's locker room. He also thinks that Isaiah was the one who orchestrated a trade that sent Dantley to the Mavericks in exchange for Mark Aguirre. It obviously worked out though since Aguirre was a better fit for the team, and the Pistons won the next two championships. Now let's take a look at some modern examples of the Ewing theory. In 2011, the Nuggets traded Melo to the Knicks for a bunch of solid players but none of them were stars. Then in 2013, the Nuggets won 57 games, more than any other season where they had Melo. Granted, they still lost in the first round of the playoffs because they did not have a legitimate star who can just take over the game, but they still had a crazy good offense that year. As a team, they averaged the most points per game in the entire league. The Nuggets were great that season for similar reasons after Adrian Dantley left Detroit. The ball movement got better and the team chemistry improved. They played more as one unit, as a team, and although Melo was one of the best scorers in the league, he did hold the ball way too long sometimes and that slowed down the team's offense. The next few instances of the Ewing Theory, Rajon Rondo, Rudy Gay, and Monte Ellis I've already talked about in another video, but I'll give you a quick summary. In the 2012-13 season when Rondo tore his ACL, the Celtics went on a 7-game winning streak immediately afterwards. Part of it has to do with how Rondo plays. Advanced stats show that the Celtics were better offensively and defensively when Rondo was on the bench. So after he got traded, it's no surprise that the team improved as a whole. Rondo also has a tendency to not try that hard unless he's playing on national TV. This is Kevin Garnett's explanation of why Boston played better without Rondo. Now for Rudy Gay and Monte Ellis, they were pretty much in the same exact situation and I'm sure most people know what happened already. Neither of them were all-stars, but they were the primary scoring options on their teams at one point. In the 2012 playoffs, the Memphis Grizzlies lost in the first round against the Clippers. Next season, they traded away Rudy Gay to Toronto and then they made the Western Conference Finals in 2013. In the 2013-14 season with Toronto, the team had a 6-12 record with Gay. But then they got rid of him and then finished the season 48-34, making the playoffs for the first time since the Chris Bosh era. In the Monte Ellis situation, Golden State traded him away and then, as we know, it gave Steph Curry the opportunity to show what he can do and look where he is now. The main reason Ellis and Gay's former teams improved without them was pretty simple. They were both high volume inefficient scorers, and teams centered around those kind of players usually don't do that well. Recently, we've seen a couple of teams lose their star players, Chicago, Atlanta, Indiana, and the LA Clippers. In my opinion, I don't think any of these teams will experience the Ewing theory. I want to say the Cavs and Celtics did too, but they kind of replaced their star with another star of a similar talent level, so we're going to leave them out. I think Chicago, Atlanta, and Indiana will be really bad next season because their stars that they lost were amazing all-around players. As for the Clippers, I'm not too sure. I don't think they're gonna be better without Chris Paul, but I don't think they're gonna be that much worse either, mainly because they still have a good team and Blake will still be there. But who knows, maybe we'll be surprised. Maybe we'll see Dennis Schroeder or Miles Turner make massive improvements in their games and turn their teams into contenders in the next few years. And that's all folks, hope you enjoyed that video, let me know what you guys think of the Ewing theory, and if you remember any other times a team got better after losing a star player. Those were the ones I could think of, but I'm sure it's happened some other times in NBA history as well. Anyway, thanks for watching, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and I'll see you guys next time.